All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's topic, which is R for logistic regression. Thank you for coming. And let me go to the next slide here. Um, so those of you who know me, you know, welcome back. Glad to see you again. Um, and also tell me, I've got the chat open. If you can't hear me or if there's anything wrong, let me know. And I'll eventually look at the chat. I'm not great about this. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, so some of you know me already. My name is Monica Wahi, and I'm trained as an epidemiologist and biostatistician, but I do informatics and I do um, all kinds of other stuff. And so therefore I am now a data scientist. Sorry, I've got like the driest throat today. So, um, so I've been doing uh, like these little lecture series because <clears throat> I'm really into software integration and now is the time, right? Because everybody, a lot of people have embraced, you know, in my field of public health, everybody's embraced SaaS, like that's sort of standard. But SaaS users are now embracing um, open source, like Python and R and other things, and, and just not open source things, just other things like Tableau. And the thing is that if you are brought up in the world, of data analytics through SAS, you often don't really uh, learn anything else and other things sort of run a little differently. So that's what um, this lecture is about. Um, if you're in public health, you do you probably do, well, it depends on what you're doing, but um, logistic regression is kind of this main tool we have in, um, in uh, biostatistics and SAS is really good at it. But open source R does logistic regression it's just a little more do it yourself. It's a little more nuanced. Um, so there are problems with SAS, right? So SAS is not perfect, like I sh have on the slide. Um, the things that the I like a lot of things about SAS, especially proc logistic. But one thing I don't like about SAS is it's hard to get the results out. I mean, you can make a PDF of the output, but it's hard to get the results out like in a CSV format. Any results, model fit, ORs, CIs, whatever. And also, SAS doesn't really want you to make a coefficient plot. Like, you don't see a plot of your your um, slopes. I, I think you can call it plots, but they're not the plots I want. They're not the ones that help me interpret it. So, um, SAS is perfectly fine for logistic regression, but I learned some tricks in R that I'm going to show you today that are can be really cool depending on what you're doing. And actually I have to say, now I tend to use, I'm showing you my sort of secret sauce for doing logistic regression. Cause now when I analyze BRFSS data or any other surveillance data, I'm gonna be doing a lot of logistic. I kind of do what I'm gonna show you today. So, all right, so before we continue, I just wanted to um, tell all of you about this free online workshop I'm holding at the end of the month. The workshop is called Application Basics, and it's aimed at people like me in public health, or in other words, people who are data scientists or learning data science, but they do not come through some sort of business school or um, computer programming school. They come through like health or, or some other domain where you don't really learn about application development, like computer applications or business applications. So the problem is in public health, they want us to analyze data from applications. They want us to connect applications together. You know, SAS wants to talk to other applications. So it's really helpful if you get a crash course in application architecture and how, how applications are built and who builds them and how they get designed. And, um, and that's what the workshop is about. So if you sign up for the workshop, which is in the link on this event, um, you get access to this for free access to the online course that goes along with this, which has all the didactic information. And we'll be working through that in our workshop. It'll be on Zoom and everybody will join. And there's a few challenges in there and I'm um, hoping enough people sign up so I get kind of a big group. And then what I can do is like split you into a few groups. I learned how to do that in Zoom like breakout groups and have you all do the challenges and then you can come back together and we'll debrief. It'll be really interesting. And don't be scared. I put a solution on there 
from my own challenge, like, you know, what the teacher does. But my solutions are boring. I want to see what you guys have to say. So please, if you're interested in this, sign up for the workshop. <clears throat> It'll be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, September 25th, 27th, and 29th. Um, each session will be about two to three hours, depending on how many people sign up. And it's at uh, noon um, Eastern time. All righty. And then after these three sessions, you'll sign up for a private wrap up with me on Zoom, just 30 minutes. All righty. Um, and if you have any questions about the workshop, let me know. I'm, I'm going to look at the chat. I'm going to try to remember to look at the chat. All right. Back to our regularly scheduled program. So what are we doing today? We're learning about R for logistic regression, even though SAS is perfectly OK. Let's just see how we can do it in R. OK, so um. I, I expect sort of a mix of people here with background. So I want to make sure those of you who are not very familiar with R understand what I'm talking about with R. R has actually two ways, two sort of interfaces. One is called R GUI and the other is called R Studio. And if you make code in R GUI, it runs in R Studio and vice versa. They're not different programs. What's different is the the like the interface you're using. So R Studio is an integrated development environment, IDE. What does that mean? It means my colleague who likes to make dashboards prefers to use R Studio because then when she runs her code, a window opens with this dashboard, and it, it's just easier for developing on the web. Well, old fashioned epidemiologist me, I just like to use our GUI. It looks sort of sass like and I'm so old fashioned. I get all upset if there's too much in my too much cognitive load in my visual stream. But it's totally up to you what you do. When I've taken my colleague's dashboard um code from our studio that she's making and I run it in our GUI, it just opens um like a web, like I use Chrome, it just opens a Chrome window and starts acting like it's our studio. So it's no problem. So I, uh, it, today's resources on the right side of the slide, you can see there's a blog post. Uh, we'll go to it later. Um, I made about this, but you can download. Oh, you can download these slides. So you have these links. Just go. It's a link in the description. Um, but then you can download this demonstration data set I'm using. It's just a, a little piece of BRFSS data. Um, just so I could demonstrate something with like a lot of data, like with thousands of rows, right? But I I made it a smaller data set. BRFSS is huge. It's got a lot of columns, a lot of rows. So it, it doesn't work so well for demonstrations, but it, it works well for pretending it's big data for a demonstration. So, um, so yeah, so those are all the resources. I'm going to demonstrate that. So going back to um, the left side of the slide, so for the you SAS users or not you SAS users, and you wonder what goes on in SAS. In SAS, what you do when you're getting ready for um, logistic regression is you prepare an analytic data set. And what you're doing is you're predicting the log odds of the probability of an occurrence of a binary um, event, like dead or alive, right? So <laughs> you've got this column with a one or a zero in it as to whether or not they got the outcome or not. That's your dependent variable. That's why you're doing logistic regression. And of course you have independent variables. So you've got to figure that out. You've got to do all your hypothesis stuff and cook up your independent variables. You know, are they going to be linear? Do you have categories? You just got to do all that work, right? If you don't know how to do it, take my LinkedIn learning course on how to do it. Um, but anyway, so you design it and then you create your your analytic data set. And if you're using SAS, you put it into SAS. There are a few different commands you can use to run logistic. Um, the, the old stirs will run proc gen mod, gen mod for meaning general model. And then you set the link as binomial, I think. Um, more modern people will use proc logistic, you know, um, but either way, I like proc logistic, but you have to add the descending option because everybody codes one as the outcome and proc logistic model zero as the outcome. Like why? I don't know. SS. But anyway, so. Um, so if you wanted to model the right thing, you have to put the descending option. Um, and then proc to logistic. I didn't run proc logistic before I'm talking. I probably should have. Um, the default output's pretty nice. Uh, so in public health, so what actually comes out on logistic regression output, just to remind you, is we're 
predicting the log odds of the probability, not the probability and not the odds. We're predicting the log odds of the probability. So you get these slopes and the intercept, right? So if you put in three covariates as your independent variables, you'll get three slopes and an intercept. And those slopes will be on the log odds scale. So if you're in engineering, I guess they don't mind that. But in public health, we can't have that. We need to turn it into an odds ratio and a 95% confidence interval. So why, why we love SAS is SAS does it for you. I think the option is risk limits. And it just and, and it, it won't just do odds ratio. It can do all kinds of stuff. You know, it's SAS. You pr we pretty much have to repress it or suppress it rather than tell it what to do. And so you get all of this output in SAS and public health sort of style. And it's really nice. You can look at it. Um, but the thing is, like I said on the last slide, you can't export it very well. Or you can't graph it very easily. In R, the whole thing is a fragmented affair. In R, it like once you get your, the analytic data set is the same. Your hypothesis is the same. Well, once you get to R, you're kind of like, uh, duct taping this whole thing together. You're kind of like creating a Rube Goldberg, like a pipeline. You're basically creating a pipeline to do what SAS just does for you, right? So the bad news is creating a pipeline means there's you, <laughs> you got to tape together a whole bunch of pieces. The good news is you get to shop for each of those pieces. You get to pick your favorites and there's a lot of options. So that's why I'm showing you this presentation today is to show you how I do mine. Right. So this is my approach. So we're going to go over now to R. Does anybody, if anybody has any questions, you can go oh, put it in the chat here. So as I said, um, let me put this over here. As I said, uh, I was, I'm going to be demonstrating using um, a little piece of a data set from the BRFSS. So the B, those of you who don't know, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey is a or system is a cross sectional anonymous phone survey in the US. So they just call numbers. They don't know who's on the other side. And then they ask them like how much they smoke and stuff. And it's cross-sectional. So they do it every year. And um, they post the data online. So it makes a really good demonstration data set for um, public health. So I, I took a piece of it like, and I made it into an RDS, which is R's native, um, it's like a SAS 7B DAT for R. Oh, and I just want, those of you who are not used to this, this is the R GUI in the console up here. This acts a lot like both the log file in SAS, as well as um, it's the log file and it, it does other things that are usually in a different place in SAS. And then if I get output, oh, like if, if tables, if I run like a freak frequency, it'll show up in here. But if I run a plot, it'll open a new window. So that's what the, con and I try to keep, you can move the console around, but I try to keep it up here because otherwise I get confused. I don't know what's going on. And you can open as many code windows as you want over here. So this is our code. We, we just have one um code, one log and code snippet today. Okay. So, and as you can see, the comments use this uh, a pound sign before them, which is an octothorpe. I like to be smart and use long words. Okay. So what's our first command is we got the read RDS, which is, it's an RDS file. Oh, I want to tell you, I've mapped this directory. Like if you go to, if you're uh, clicked on the console and you choose, see down here, change directory. Like I chose a directory like basically a, a folder where I put this RDS data set. So when it tries to read it in, it's only looking there. Like I forced it to only look there. So um, so this R, read RDS file is, is going to read, and this is an arrow, so it's going to put it in an object. Now, if I just ran this, if I just ran this code, which is a bad idea, it would just print this to the, to the console, but I don't want. I want to read this in and put it into this, data frame that's what it's called in um in r as a data frame so let's let's run this code so i highlight and i do control r but what it does is it actually just transfers this to the um i guess this isn't a very big data set so i'm going to run column names that's kind of like proc contents only just says a column so i'm going to and, and the name of the data frame is brfss so oh here we go all right so you can kind of recognize some of these column names if you're used to using the brfss um uh, data said, let's go click on this here. 
like you've got like um smoke day you remember this x h g h group is over here good so there's a bunch of native variables in here and there's a bunch of um uh transform variables so what i've done is i a lot of these um like age group for instance it it has higher cardinality that i want that there's too many groups so i'll collapse them into a smaller group but then i'll make a set of indicator variables like one zeros for it okay so to demonstrate logistic regression, it was just a little easier to make a, a Mickey Mouse hypothesis so I could show you what I was doing. Oh, and let me show you how many rows are in this, the number of rows in our demonstration data set. It's about, it's almost 60,000. So what I'm doing makes sense. It's kind of like small big data. All right. So I came up with this Mickey Mouse hypothesis because in reality, what you would really do is you'd actually have a real hypothesis. You'd have this outcome and you'd have shopped around in the BRFSS and you'd have chosen candidate covariates that you wanted to put in there. And you would do some sort of um, stepwise modeling process to choose what actually stays in the model because you're going to get collinearity if you use a data set like this. I'm just pretending we we have one model and I'm just showing you how to do that. And it's just a simple model, okay? And so as you can see here, it's this is what the model means. It's the hypothesis is having no insurance plan, which is no plan, yes, no. If you have a one for no plan, it means you have no health insurance plan. This is the US. So having no health insurance plan is the exposure in this little pretend thing. Um, so it's a risk factor for poor health. So the outcome is poor health yes no and that actually is just a level from the general health question you know, where you ask how how would you rate your health and you know there's people go from excellent all the way down to poor so i just take flag the pores that's the outcome which is really bad by the way if you are rating yourself as poor in that question all all kinds of research says you really are sick right so it makes kind of sense right to have a hypothesis that not having an insurance plan would be associated with poor health. But we also know that education is a confounder. So I had uh, um, a several level of uh, uh, categorical variable about education, and I turned it into um, just two indicator variables, one which is called low ed, and one which is called some call for some college. So this is the lowest education. I forgot what exactly it is. And this is some college. And the reference group then that's not in there. So that this is what these ORs are going to be compared to is people who completed college. Okay. So that's our equation is the dependent variable is poor health. And then this is not an equals, it's actually a tilde. So that's how we're specifying the model. No plan, which is our exposure, plus our confounders, low ed and some call, okay? And people ask me, like, why do you do that, Monica? Why didn't you just call it education and just put it in there as a, like, continuous variable? And I'm like, because it's not a continuous variable, like, this is the way to do it. It, it could have an independent slope. If you're looking for a dose response, how are you going to see it, you know, so... So I just get so irritated. I'm sorry. It's like, because there are reviewers and I'm like, do you even know what you're doing? But anyway, like once reviewers, they came back, I said, we ran iterative logistic regression models. And they said, don't you mean interactive? And I'm like, no, I mean iterative. But anyway, so how you formulate the, this is like, remember PROC GLM? This is like PROC GLM, only it's GLM. And we've got our equation here with a comma. We specify our data, which is our data frame up here. Family equals binomial. So do, do you feel like PROC Gen Mod coming on here? It's very similar to PROC Gen Mod um, code. And if I, if I run this, it'll it'll present to the screen. Actually, let's see. I'm just going to do that control R here. And look at what we get, OK? And this is on the console. So it shows you what it ran. And it, it says what it's calling. <laughs> Isn't this uh, awkward? You get the intercept and then you get the log odds like slope and this, you know, each of the slopes is so hard to look at. Um, 
you don't get much in the way of model fit statistics, but you can. You can do the negative to a lot of the likelihood. You, you can get a package for that. You can get other packages for model fit statistics. Um, but for free, you get the AIC. And I like the AIC, but the AIC is only a sort of comparative model fit one. Like only if you're fitting iterative models, not interactive, but iterative, um, can you really use the AIC to choose models? So you might want to go with the negative two log likelihood approach if you know it. Um, I actually haven't met people who know that, but uh, I never fight. I don't fight with these models that much, so it's too much trouble. But you see how awkward this looks. So well, that's um, actually, if I run this, see this, how it says logistic model? That's just a val. I, I could have called that, you know, S Suzanne. I could call it anything. I just chose the word logistic model. So this is, I'm making an object here. Um, this logistic model here, I'm going to turn it into this object. Okay, so now it's an object called logistic model. Now, if I run summary on this logistic model, it'll start looking more sassy. Yeah, doesn't that look like sass, right? Now it's all nice. You have the intercept and the three um, covariates. You got the log odds estimate, standard error, Z value. This means um, P value. This is really ugly, but see this these three asterisks there's this little thing down here that's a code for significance right and i know what you're thinking no plan is actually not significant our exposure is not significant like we have a null study we should quit no i'm just kidding actually the reason I, I don't know why that is but in the u.s people um tend to have uh, people who are poor are on medicaid and so they tend not to be quite that sick and so um, it, it's hard to find people with no plan that actually participate in the BRFSS. I mean, there's just a bunch of selection bias and other issues going on there. But anyway, this is not even a real model. But this is what you see. So this would be this is sort of your your results of your model. But it's not really that easy to report. And I want to show you what kind of object we just made. We just made this GLM LM object. OK, so this is not a data frame. It's it's this thing. Okay, I want to know the odds ratios, right? And you probably do too. So how do we do the odds ratios? So this is basically what we're going to do is we're going to turn this this output or this logistic model thing, we're going to turn it into an actual data set. We won't turn it into a data frame. That's one way of having data sets. We're going to turn it into a tibble, which is a different way. Now, there's a really popular package in R called Deplier, which is very SQL-like for managing data. And that operates on tibbles and people like that. I don't like tibbles. I've never liked them. I guess you just have different ways you like it. But that what you'll be seeing here is the tibble. You know, what you've been seeing now up to now is a data frame version of data. You'll see this now in what I'm going to do. So I say, what are the hours? So library in um, R loads packages. So just to be clear, you know how in SAS you have base SAS, you have SAS stat, and then you can add components depending on how much money you have and you're willing to pay to SAS. Um, in R, you have base R, but base R is really, really lean. It's much leaner than base SAS because it's open source. So you don't, it doesn't have to have much. Um, and then the community makes packages. There's a, um, a server called the CRAN server, C-R-A-N, and if you get packages off of that, in fact, our GUI is automatically connected to that. That's how I put these packages in. I just refreshed my R because I was helping a customer. Um, so before I did this today, I went and made sure I had downloaded all the packages. So when I run this library dev tools and library room, it actually loads something. See that? If I ran that and it didn't load it, I would have to go and put load the package into my instance. Basically, it's like saying, Oh, I got to load my component into SAS. Well, you know, this is free, so I love it. It's my favorite price. Okay, so now that we've loaded these libraries, we're going to use the tidy command from one of them on this logistic model. So remember, this logistic model is not a data frame or a tibble. It's just this weird GLM LM thing that looks nice, but it's not something we can take it out of the environment and like graph it or make a table out of it and put it in a journal or a dissertation or anything. So what we're going to do is tidy it up. We're going to run the tidy command on it and turn it into this 
object called tidy model. I just called it that. So I'm going to run this. And now um, we can look at the tidy model. I'm going to run the tidy model just so you can see it. And you're like, okay. Hmm. So it kind of looks like a data set, doesn't it? It looks like a data set where, where term. Now see the CHR, DBL, see this little notation and see how it says a tibble, four by five. That's how you know you're looking at a tibble just from the output, the way it prints the screen. But it's a data set. Um, so you have the first column says term. And it's like intercept, no plan, low ed, and some call. So that's the values of that. And then you have estimate. So this is called estimate. So if I wanted to add something to this, I would refer to the tidy model, the table tidy model, and then the the variable estimate. And this variable is called std dot error. And this is called statistic. And it's called p dot value. So this this is a little baby data set. Okay. And so, um, and actually, let's look at the class, which tells you what the type of object it is. And um, see, it says TBL underscore DF, TBL data frame. So I guess a tibble has, oh, this is why it's called tibble. I, I didn't even know that before I did this. Um, but I guess it holds a whole bunch of objects in it. That's what's kind of confusing to me about R. Um, a lot of people who are especially mathematicians like it because you can hold like lists in there, like where there's a bunch of members of the same thing, but each member has different child, mem different numbers of child members. It's super confusing, but I guess that happens in math a lot. So some people like it, but I get confused. So now we have, we have our type. So what have we done? We calculated our logistic regression model. We created the summary model object. It was beautiful. But we wanted to take it out of the environment in like a CSV format. So we loaded this and we converted it into this Tibble format. And now let's get it out. Let's get it out of the environment. But <laughs> let's stop for public health, right? Because I don't like these um these log odd, these log odds uh uh slopes, right? Like I want to know what the odds ratio is and the 95% confidence interval. So remember the standard error, remember the estimate? Let's go and let's go break into it. So I'm going to add some calculations before I export this tidy model. Remember that's the name of it, right? So tidy model with a dollar sign and then OR simply refers to this is saying that's the field in this table. So a lot of times when we're doing things like this in SAS, we're doing a data step. So we've already declared the output data set at the bottom, like data B set A, and then we just start talking about variables in data set A. Here, you know, R is very transactional. It's not, it doesn't create a, you know, like you start a data step you're, and you're like, okay, this is gonna be a big data step. We're gonna be hanging around together for a while. R is very transactional. It's like, oh, you wanna add a data? Just edit it, edit it, just do, do it. You know, leave me out of it. Don't run loops and stuff like that. So here I specify the output um, variable. I'm going to call it OR, right? It's the odds ratio. So how how am I going to calculate that? Well, I'm going to take the EXP of tidy model estimate, this thing over here. And yeah, it's going to calculate for the intercept. I'll just ignore the intercept. Um, but it's going to do it for the other ones too. So I'm going to get this column called OR with the odds ratio in it. And while I'm there, I might as well also add the lower limit, see the lower limit and the upper limit. And I'm using a 95% confidence interval because you see my um, my statistic here I'm using. And you see what I'm doing. I'm taking the estimate minus, for the lower one, minus um, the margin of error here by using that. At least see what I'm doing. You know what I'm doing. All right. So I create those things. Actually, let me run it before I forget. And then let's look at it again. Oh, we did. We see. <laughs> so remember, before we forget that we were actually running a model. So we're predicting poor health, you know, saying that you have poor health, which is really bad. Like I said, low ed, the 95 percent confidence interval is like 2.3 to like 2.8. So that's like. They have between 2.3 and 2.8 times the like the odds of having poor health compared to like high college people, like college graduates. And with some college, it's one, it's only 1.5 to 1.88. So that's a dose response. 
isn't it? All right, where's Bradford Hill when you need him? But here's our no plan where it C crosses the um one, it crosses unity. We already knew all that and and then just ignore the intercept. Okay. So now awesome. We have what we want. Let's export it. So we're gonna export it as a CSV, right? Because that's easy to put in Excel. So I'm calling I'm just gonna call it tidy mile. When you export stuff from R, try to keep the names the same or you'll like literally go crazy. So I'm gonna go over um to where I exported it and actually open it to show it to you. Um, okay, so this is what the CSV looks like. It's probably what you thought it would be. You know, it's a little hard to see this, I guess, if I do like this format cells and just do like this number. Uh, see, these are the odds ratio. Remember, I was just freaking out over this and over this. And see, these are all out there. And, you know, these p-values look, um, I love the format painter. Don't you love the format painter? Yeah, see, the these are really, really baby p-values. And this is a terrible p-value. Um, but you can copy this into Excel. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. It just makes it so easy to get your um, model results out. Okay, you stuck with me this long. You deserve a special bonus. So what happens to me a lot is if I'm making a model with like, I, let's say I'm making a model like this, but I have like 20 candidate covariates or 15 and I fit the model and I end up with maybe 10 survive the modeling process. I love using that terminology. It's so harsh. I I have to write about this in the, um in like the, results. I have to like figure out how to interpret it. And remember, some of those results might be like risk factors and some of them um, might be protective factors. So it's hard to interpret. Oh, somebody's got a question here. Um, do we have any data set in R where we have the results of logistic regression and tidy model? No, um, we wouldn't, but we could. I'm going to, I'm of course creating a situation here, but if you use, you know how I use this write CSV um, command? If I wanted an RDS, like this data set, if I want to turn this into an RDS, I wouldn't use that. I would use save RDS, tidy model, and then um, tidy model.rds. Is that... Um, Wait, does that answer your question? I hope it does. But anyway, so if the reason why I chose CSV here is because then you can get it in Excel easy. If you choose RDS, it really only R can read it in. But the um, advantage of choosing RDS is the next time you go to read it in R, it goes really fast and R knows what you're talking about. Just like when you use SAS and you bring in a SAS 7B DAT, it, you're, it's so happy. If you try to bring an Excel file, it asks you a bunch of questions. You know what I'm saying? So there are reasons to not use CSV, but um, but I hope hopefully that answers your question. All right. So I was getting back to the issue I have is when I have these really big uh, models, final models, and I have to go, oh, okay, good, great. Um, I have these final models and um, I have to interpret them. And, you know, some of the odds ratios are risky, like that 2.5 to 2.8 or whatever. But some might be protective. So, like, let's pretend I had put something in the model, like, um, like takes a multivitamin or something, or like is on a vegetarian diet or something. That might have been protective. That might have been a, a statistically significantly, like the odds ratio might have been like between 0.7 and 0.8, meaning that people on the vegetarian diet have seven 0.7 to 0.8 or 70 to 80 percent of the odds of the people who are not on that diet, you know, so they have only 70% of the odds, you know, which is less, you know what I'm saying? Rather than 200% of the odds, which is bad, right? And so how do you keep this all in your head? I mean, this is not a bad table, but now just in your mind, just imagine like columns and columns of that, right? And I'm trying to interpret this. Like this is on one, one, one of my screens and I'm writing on the other one. I'm like, what is going on here? So this is what I did is I found 
this library, this this package and R called ARM, you know, like your ARM. I, I don't know why I call it ARM. Somebody will tell me. I never know why they name these packages things and then people say, duh, Monica. like Deplier. I never knew why they named it that. But it's like pliers. Like you can do anything with data. I was like, thanks. <laughs> I'm just so naive when it comes to this stuff. But anyway, so this ARM um, library, the only thing I've ever used it for and I love it for is this coefficient plot. So before I make the plot, you're going to see confidence limits um, graphed out on the plot. They are not the 95% interval, uh, confidence interval I calculated. They are two um, SEs, like plus or minus two SEs. And it just, that's the way the plot is built. But so it's not the most beautiful plot and I probably wouldn't put it in a, a journal. Oh my God, it's so easy to interpret your resulting um, model by looking at this plot. So first, actually, let me just first run the plot and then I'll go back and tell you what I did with the um, code to make it run. So I'm gonna run the plot. Um, okay, here it is. So let's go look at this plot here. Let me see if I can, okay. So you'll see here, it says risk factors for poor, obviously I put that title there and poor health was what I was modeling. So you, you know that there is really an um, intercept in there. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Khaled. ARM, data analysis using regression and multi-level hierarchical models. W where's the ARM part? <laughs> A analysis regression multi-level? <laughs> Maybe that's it. Thank you for that title. That's the right title. There's probably more in there, like hier hierarchical models. Might want to check that one out. I've, I'm always looking for a good hierarchical model package. So maybe I'll have to look at that one. So, but anyway, I've just braided this package for the coefficient plot. So you'll remember that we've got an intercept in here and the coefficient plot command needs the intercept to be in the underlying data set, but you're not going to see the intercept here. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is that you'll notice this is still on the log odd scale. This is this zero unity is log odd scale. But it doesn't matter because I'm just using this for interpretation to write like the the results and discussion. And um all I need to know is really the relative position of all these. So you remember that no insurance was our exposure and high school diploma, that low education was our um, was our first confounder, I guess. And then some college was our second confounder. And so as you can see, you can see the dose response here so easily. And oh, just to be clear, what's being graphed here in the center is the log odds. And then you, if you look closely, you'll see that there's this thick line and then a thinner line. And that's the standard error. And the um or that's one standard error one plus or minus one and this is plus or minus two so this is straddling unity we knew that right we have a null study on our hands and we knew that the these two were very um were very risky right um and they're looking great so using your imagination like imagine i had like 20 covariates in here like for instance let's say i had a bunch of age groups and i had chunked them up like with independent variable like flags right the binary variables i'd have like a whole clump i'd have all these clumps of like um like income you know all these these series of flags and this would get really long but what i'll do is i'll color code them and stuff let me show you the uh, plot or the um code so i call library arm and then i create a vector called var labels so it, it's just a vector i i said intercept no insurance high school diploma some college they're basically my labels this is the vector and then let me get this all the way here so as you can see here this is var labels right let me run var labels now i created var labels and you know i notice i'm using an equals here. I usually use this um, arrow, but I think I must have copied this from the coefficient plot. Um, oh, I even misspelled it too. I must have copied this from the coefficient plot um, uh, documentation. Well, it's on GitHub. I'll update it. You'll see my commit, right? <laughs> so, um, so okay. So these are the variable labels, but it's uh, nothing's happened yet. The plot hasn't happened yet. This is just um, 
uh, a vector that says these things, okay? And this par, this is parameters, and this sets up how the output plot comes out. And I, to be honest with you, I forgot the arguments for this. Here is the main thing I want to show is this coefficient plot um, argument that comes out of the um, arm. So you, I, I just made indentations and stuff, ggplot2 style, so you could see what's on each line. So first I call the logistic model. Now notice I'm calling the actual logistic model, not the tibble that we made in the, the tidy one. I'm calling the original one. I'm making vertical equals false because I wanted it horizontal here. Then y limit, what is that? Y limits, right? So I have negative one to 1.5. I don't know why I picked that. I guess I forgot that I was on the log scale or no, that makes sense. I, I No, I must've known I was on the log scale. I don't know. I just picked that, I guess, because it looked good. It covered everybody. And then here's the main risk factors for poor health. I, I put that, that, that's the title. And then it says var names is the option. So see how I handle these two options differently. This is the color option. In the color option, I just put the whole, um, the words, the letter C, I think stands for combine. So I put the whole vector in. I said dark blue, dark orange, blue, violet, dark green. And if you're curious about these colors in R, um, you should look at, I have a, a blog post about different ways you can specify colors in R. So I took one of the ways, which is they have some num names programmed in. So I just, I don't know why I picked these names. But, um, and you can look for these palettes online, what, what blue violet really means or what dark green really means. So I did that here. You know what I could have done is I could have taken this whole vector and I could have named it like color color list and then just say call equals color list. I, I could have done that. But I, I just did it two different ways to show you two different ways to do it. And the reason why I'll do it um, with color, the reason why I'll sometimes move it up here and then call it as a vector is because I don't know what colors I want and I want to kind of fuss around with them and it's just easier if it's up here than digging around in the code. But anyway, so that's sort of my annotation of how I got this coefficient plot and what it is for. So let's go back to uh, our slideshow here because I'm already over time. So, um, so in summary, these are the steps I did in R and that if you go to my blog post or you download this or whatever, you'll see that that's uh, what I did. So first I prepared the analytic data set in R, I used an RDS, and I specified the candidate independent variables, independent variable. Then I used the GLM, which is in base R, to create an object in R, it, and it was to create the logistic regression equation on the log scale. Then I used the um, library, the packages DevTools and Broom, to run the tidy command on that object to create a tidy object, which is really a tibble, um, to make the results into a data frame. Well, I said data frame, it's really a tibble that you can edit. Uh, it's a data set you can edit. Um, and then step four was using the data editing, you know, just data editing commands. I added, you know, calculations. I added the OR and then the confidence limits on the um, odds ratio, uh, for the odds ratio. Then I exported the results as a CSV, but I could have exported them as RDS. But as a CSV, it's easy to open them in Excel and just copy them out and maybe use them in Tableau or somewhere else for graphing. And as a bonus, um, using the original GLM object, I use the command coefficient plot or coef plot from the package arm to make this coefficient plot. And again, it's not really a journaly plot. I wouldn't really use it in a journal. I use it just to help myself um, interpret the results of the model when I'm writing about it. All right, so that was our presentation today. I'm, I'm look over at the chat. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So, um, and if you download the um, slides, you'll get you know all these links to my blog and those blog posts. Um, those of you, I'm so happy that you stayed this whole time. If you missed it in the beginning, uh, let me re-announce it. Um, at the end of this month, uh, specifically on Monday, the, September 25th, Wednesday, September 27th, and Friday, September 29th, I'm running a workshop. I It's a workshop in application basics, like how applications are made, how they are architected. And I'm talking about like computer applications or business applications. You know how like we data analysts are always saying, oh, analyze Twitter data, or I guess it's called X now, or analyze, you know, 
data from these exercise applications or whatever. So you really have to understand application architecture and they don't really teach you that in public health or in these in biostatistics. They teach you that if you come through like a business school and learn computer science, but not everybody does that. So if you're if you fall in the category of people who've never really been taught that, this is perfect for you. It's free. It's online. It's through Zoom like we're doing now. And um I already have like a course management um, system set up like with the online course. So all your materials are there. I'll give you free access to it. Um, Oh, there's a question. Niraj, thank you for the session. Do we have any workshop or session on sample size calculation for epidemiologic studies? No, but I'll, I'll take that into consideration. I can add that to my next series. I usually do a few of these in each series. Um, just as a quick answer, Niraj, I like to do my power calculations in a free application called G Power. Okay. And it was developed <laughs> in a, a European university that I can't pronounce. I want to say Dusseldorf, but I don't think that's right. But if you Google for G Power, actually, if you Google for G Power, you'll find a lot of tutorials and it's free. It's a sweet, cute little app. All it does is power calculations for you. You know they're right. The trick is it's it's so good at power calculations. You have to really know what you're doing. You, it, it's got like a wizard. It's a really neat little program. Um, yeah, see, to be honest, Niraj, I don't use R or SAS for calculating G power. I, I, I or calculating um sample size. I always use G power. And the reason why is I like to calculate multiple scenarios like what if the effect size is little what if the effect size is big what if the standard deviation is little what is the standard deviation is big what if we don't get very much sample what if we get a lot of sample what if we don't have any power what if we are like i like to create like this huge scenario and then i like to like decide where i want to be in that scenario and g power is so nice because you know you're like you can take a screenshot of how you set up like what you're entering each time you're making it calculate. And so I would I would say that it's better to, you like if you use G power and you know what you're doing, you make sure you know what you're doing, you're basically doing best practices. It's, it's a really good tool. So I would advocate everybody use that. It's only for power calculation, sample size calculation. But if you if you do it and you keep your notes right, it's probably you're probably doing it right. <laughs> so, you know, where um, SAS has proc power, and I'm sure there's a million things in R, and I never remember. I I can't ever remember if I'm doing it right. In in G power, you can make sure you're doing it right. Um, but yeah, and and you should um be able to find a lot. I, you know, actually, if you guys go on my blog. And you search for G power. I, I something tells me I posted something on it, but I, I don't. You know, I, my blog's gotten kind of big, so I kind of kind of don't remember either that or something maybe on YouTube. Just just look on my YouTube channel or look on my blog, and maybe there's something there. Um, but getting back to this workshop, if you uh if you want to come to this workshop, it'll be great because you can use you'll be using my course management system, but I'll be teaching the workshop, and we have several challenges, and um. Uh, so my, and let's see if Ebenezer is still here. My assistant Ebenezer has been helping me, um, you know, get the workshops ready and everything. And so a lot of people have signed up. So that means when you come to the workshop and we, we I teach you the stuff and we have these challenges, I can put you in groups and you can do the challenges and then we can come back together. Um, but don't be scared because I also did like a teacher's version of the challenge. So you can see like... <laughs> <laughs> what what my solution was but that's what's fun about applications is they're they're actually things you design so uh, that's part of why i want to run this workshop is i want people who are creative in the biostatistics space to also be able to be empowered with the knowledge to be creative in the application space all right everybody so um assuming there are no more questions thank you very much for showing up today and um uh watching my demonstration of how to do logistic regression in R. And I look forward to seeing you at another event or the workshop. Thank you for watching this video, which is part of the Public Health to Data Science rebrand program. If you are interested in joining the program, please sign up for a 30-minute Zoom interview using the link in the description.